Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I'm very happy. My name is Ulla Eichhorst. I work as an advisor on transport and climate change at the GIZ, uh, the German Development Corporation. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second episode of the joint UNFCCC Secretariat and GIZ webinar series on methodologies for greenhouse gas baselines and monitoring in the transport sector. And today's episode is on complex urban transport programs or plans. So how can we account for the emissions of such overarching programs and plans in urban transport? And before we start with the actual content, just a very quick introduction to the technology. We use GoToWebinar, I think many of you will be familiar with uh, it. And most importantly, you find a questions pane and I would like to invite everybody to just type any question that occurs to you during the presentations into the questions pane. We'll have a joint Q&A sessions at the end of the webinar. So we will collect all the questions as we go along and then come back to them in the end. So I would like to ask everybody for a little bit of patience uh, that we won't have uh, interventions in between, uh, but rather discuss everything uh, all together at the end. And everybody uh, is automatically muted so that we don't get any background noise, uh, but anything that you want to say, please, in the, through the questions pane. Now, when we look at the agenda for today, what is ahead of us is that I'll give a short introduction uh, on the passenger and freight transport volume, and then also present uh, the approach of urban transport greenhouse gas inventory to account for emissions in urban transport. Secondly, Charles Kushian from CCAP, the Center of Clean Air Policy, will present us with an alternative approach, the control group approach that is being developed for the transit-oriented development NAMA they are uh, implementing in Colombia. And then thirdly, I'm also very glad that we have Arnaud Godet from Ciudad with us, who will give us uh, a little more insight on the practical experience with this uh, transit-oriented development NAMA in Colombia and the MRV approach that is currently being developed. And then we have the Q&A session and approximately we are planning to have the first half of the webinar for the presentations and then the second half uh, we have for questions. The webinar will also be recorded and then be made available to everybody uh, after the webinar as well. So I'd like to have a, a short, closer look at the, our speakers of today. I already mentioned Charles Kushian. Uh, he works with uh, the Center for Clean Air Policy in the US and in his everyday work works with national and local officials around the world to develop transportation and land use policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And he has a long background in transport planning. And also, he is the main author of the passenger and tra freight transport volume uh, that I'll present a little more on in a minute. Anno Godet, he works for Findeter uh, in Colombia as an environmental specialist and coordinator of the Center for Urban Interventions of Advanced Development of Transportation. Uh, and he'll also give us a little more detail on what Ciudad uh, actually is and does, and he is in charge of developing the MRV of the TOD NAMA implemented in Colombia. So we are very happy to also have like a, a practitioner with us here today. And then myself, as I already mentioned, I work as an advisor on transport and climate change for GIZ, and uh, my current work is very much focused on implementing the NDCs in the transport sector, and particularly we cooperate in our project uh, called Advancing Transport Climate Strategies, which is funded through the German Environment Ministry's International Climate Initiative uh, with uh, Kenya and also uh, with Vietnam Ministries of Transport 
in developing their climate change strategy in the sector. And one of our focus areas is uh, transparency and MRV, how to account for the emissions uh, in the transport sector. And in that regard, I also consult with other projects of GIZ that are being implemented in Peru and Tunisia on issues of uh, monitoring and reporting. So back to the actual content, a short introduction of the transport volume and uh, I'll provide you with a link at, towards the end of the presentation. Maybe some of you have already seen it. Uh, maybe some of you have also participated in the earlier webinar we had on fuel economy standards. Um, the passenger and freight transport volume is one volume in the series that is called Compendium on Greenhouse Gas Baselines and Monitoring. And other volumes include industry buildings or agriculture. Uh, and each of them is developed by a lead organization in cooperation with the uh, UNFCCC Secretariat. So the whole idea behind this compendium was really to, as a multi-stakeholder effort, to gather together the existing methodologies and tools that already uh, have been developed and are ready to be used uh, to monitor the emission reductions uh, from mitigation activities. And uh, this still basically stem from the motivation that um, MRV is uh, increasingly being demanded for climate finance projects and that um, often uh, stakeholders feel that uh, the component of accounting for the emissions is uh, difficult and so the idea was really to give an overview of all the existing knowledge that al is already there that can be applied and that things do not have to be redeveloped from scratch every time and again. Now the GIZ uh, was responsible to develop the passenger and freight transport volume and as mentioned before Chuck was also the lead author of this volume and uh, contributions were made uh, by uh, a lot of different stakeholders also uh, UNDP, uh, the Infrast Institute on Fuel Pricing Policies which will be uh, included in the next upcoming edition and then the ICCT developed a uh, chapter on the fuel economy standards. But today you can see that overall uh, the volume covers these eight mitigation action types that you can see on the right and today we would like to talk about comprehensive urban transport programs. So just to give you a short glimpse of what is in, in, in the transport volume, each of the chapters starts with outlining the impact chain of this particular mitigation action type. And what you can see in this slide is the impact chain of comprehensive urban transport program. So um, it essentially shows the variables that are targeted by the mitigation action and how they should be affected by it. So you see that the expected effects that are grouped into essentially avoid, shift, improve, and fuel um, effects and then also related to uh, the recurring indicators that would then have to be monitored depending on uh, your actual uh, program and what measures it, it includes. So these can include uh, compact city design, which is the case also in the TOD NAMA. It could also include uh, parking management, walking and cycling investments, usually public transport investments, but also can it include things like uh, updated uh, vehicle fleets for public transport or fuel switch in these uh, in these fleets. So it of course will depend on the specific uh, program uh, that you design, which indicators will ultimately uh, become uh, necessary for you to uh, to to monitor. But is uh, usually these this is how the impact chain works. And we'll see that with the two methodologies we're presenting today, uh, the, the approach is a little bit uh, different. One looks more at the trips, on the trips basis, and the other one looks more at the uh, vehicle kilometer uh, traveled of the different vehicle types. So then, as this, we, now we're still in the transport volume, what you also get in the volume is an overview of uh, what we call it, basically a navigator of the different methodologies and tools to get a first idea 
uh, of the level of accuracy and the purpose of this particular methodology or tool. Is it ex ante or ex post? Um, to just give you a first uh, orientation, uh, depending on what it is you're looking for, because the transport volume is really meant to be sort of uh, uh, repository that can help you identify the right methodology for uh, whatever uh, measure it is you're looking at. And then in addition to these maps, it also has a tabular guide that distinguishes more ca characteristics of the different uh, volumes and also goes on to describe the different uh, data and indicators that need to be monitored. So today we would like to pick two out of these. Uh, so the Mobilize Your City MRV approach, which is essentially a territori territorial approach of an urban transport emissions inventory. Uh, and then also uh, the approach that is uh, developed for the Columbia TOD NAMA. So I would like to start uh, with the urban transport greenhouse gas inventory approach, which is for instance also used in the Mobilize Your City initiative, um, but also by uh, many other initiatives as I will show. So the Mobilize Your City initiative, just very briefly, is a, a multi-donor partnership uh, co-financed by the German Environment Ministry, the AFD, and also the European Commission uh, with French and German partners uh, that aims to engage 100 cities in sustainable urban mobility planning in 20 different countries uh, around the globe. And for Mobilize Your City, we summarized again this approach of doing a, an urban greenhouse gas inventory so that in all the cities where MYC is active, we can follow the same and comparable uh, approach to uh, emissions accounting. And you can see uh, it's available for download. But I just want to say that the approach in general, of course, was not developed uh, just for MYC. It's a standard approach that is being used uh, around uh, the world, uh, also in the greenhouse gas protocol, it's recommended uh, in German cities, it's also recommended and um, in a cooperation that we had with the World Bank and by in the JEF project, we also used it in China, so uh, it's a really uh, common approach uh, for emission accounting at city level whenever you look at more than one measure. And this is what you can see here on the left. So uh, what is important to note is that uh, with a comprehensive program, of course, things become complex and the impacts occur at different levels. So um, in some cases, you may or you may not have a national urban transport policy or program uh, as the general framework for the interventions that take place at the city level. And then what you can see here in the white uh, columns, you can have different individual measures. This could be metro extension, bus extension, it can be fleet renewal uh, activities, promotion of walking and cycling, and also all sorts of other things. So you have this level of the individual measures, but you also have this uh, level of the package of measures. So uh, basically the, um, the sum of all these measures, and this is the effect that you will ultimately see at the city level. And it's because of that, um, and because all these measures, of course, interact with each other, that uh, we say for a complex uh, intervention, uh, complex plan like that, that includes a whole range of different activities, um, a greenhouse gas inventory approach is the most suitable approach to actually capture the overall outcome of this policy package. And it is for that reason that the system boundary that we're looking at is uh, the traffic in the city territory. So uh, we have the city territory and we really look at all the traffic and transport that occurs within these boundaries. Uh, so this includes uh, the traffic of inhabitants as long as it takes place in the city boundary, but it also includes uh, the traffic of incoming uh, visitors uh, as long as they're in the city territory. And the reason for that is that this is the system boundary that is most closely connected to the sphere of influence also of the city government developing such a uh, sustainable urban mobility plan uh, that actually affects 
all the traffic that occurs in the, its own territory. So this means that if we look at a, uh, a at an urban transport greenhouse gas inventory for passenger transport, that is in this case, uh, we essentially want to know the greenhouse gas emissions of all the different vehicle types, passenger cars, public transport, motorcycles, and what have you, it could be tricycles as well, and so on and so forth. And then for each of those, we are interested in the transport activity that occurs in the city territory, and then uh, essentially multiplying that with the specific energy consumption of the different um, vehicles multiplied by a specific greenhouse gas emission factor for that particular fuel type. And these two together can also be expressed as an emission factor per transport activity in grams of CO2 per kilometer. So this is uh, essentially a, a very simple formula. We look at the transport activity by each uh, vehicle mode and then uh, each transport mode and then multiplied with the respective emission factor. And this means that um, the main indicators for monitoring for us essentially are the fleet composition. So understanding what types of vehicles are actually running on my streets in the city. And this includes both uh, different types of passenger cars, different types of buses and so on, as well as the annual uh, vehicle kilometers traveled uh, in the territory by each mode. The monitoring interval that we suggest for NYC is every one to three years. And of course, additional data that you need is the ideally country specific emission factors for these different vehicle types. So uh, I'm coming back to this chart that I showed in the beginning. And you can see that in terms of the indicators monitored, we uh, in this greenhouse gas inventory approach really look at the numbers of vehicle by type in the city and then the kilometers by vehicle type and the fuel consumption of these vehicles. Of course, this does not mean that uh, the interventions may also affect uh, uh, the trips by mode by expanding public transport, but the effect of this is eventually summarized in, uh, in the kilometers that are being traveled by the vehicles uh, in terms of our emissions profile. So, and the number of vehicles that are necessary to transport all these people on the new system. So this is a VKT based approach to greenhouse gas accounting. And just to go into a little more detail to say that uh, this approach can be uh, implemented at different levels of detail. So we go back to this, uh, to this general approach and then what we, if we look at passenger cars, for instance, then we want to break them down into different fuel types. We have gasoline, diesel, we might have uh, gas fueled vehicles, electric vehicles. And then we can break these down further by different uh, engine size. And then also we can even break it down even further by, uh, by vehicle age. And then for each of those, uh, make an estimate of the uh, vehicle kilometers traveled. Of course, if this detailed data is available, otherwise I just use a general average uh, VKT. And then if I break it down as much as that, then I can also break down the emission factors uh, in, into more detailed categories. If data is not available, then of course I have to calculate with more average uh, values for, um, for, for the different vehicle types. And then I just wanted to mention also that in Mobilize Your City, the greenhouse gas impact that you see uh, in green here is, of course, is only one aspect that we are monitoring overall. We're also interested in what we call the sustainable mobility impact, where we look at the mode split, um, but also look at issues like access to mobility, uh, safety, and commercial speed as an indicator for the efficiency of the transport system. And furthermore, we also monitor the, the mobilized public or private funding that is being invested uh, in the initiative to get an, another angle uh, of the progress of the transformation really or implementation of the sustainable urban mobility plan. And then at the level of each individual measure also collect data, of course, on the implementation progress itself to get an indication if, uh, if measures are on track. 
but for the greenhouse gas impact, we really look at the whole package of measures uh, at the city level. And then to close, I would just really like to point out again that this territorial approach is really global good practice. It's recommended by the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, it's also recommended by, in the middle, you have a German tool that's being used by German cities. Uh, it's a municipal planning assistant for energy and climate change uh, that is uh, provided to German cities. And also in a cooperation that we held, ha had with the World Bank uh, in China, we also applied this same approach in Chinese cities uh, as in the city of Chengdu and looked at the different, collected the data then uh, for the different vehicles of different vehicle size, vehicle age, looked at the different fuels they used and then ultimately calculated uh, the emissions for the years 2014, 15, 2016. So this was my input. I thank you very much already uh, for your attention and would like to hand over to Chuck to present us regarding the approach they're using in Colombia. Thank you, Urda. And I'm very happy that um, CCAP is able to participate in this and explain this different approach for a slightly different type of NAMA. So although an inventory approach is the best practice at the city level, what do you do if your intervention is at a neighborhood level from the beginning? And what we have at the Columbia TOD NAMA is a program which starts at the neighborhood level to try to improve the accessibility and the transit use in, at, in a neighborhood. So we have three pilot projects going on in different cities in Colombia at the neighborhood level, which is then complemented by policy action at the city and national level. So what we expect to see is the first effects manifest themselves within these neighborhoods. Then as the replication scales up, we'll see things happening at the city level and then ultimately at the national level in the long term. So we have three cities and in each city specific region or a sub region, the neighborhood has been selected for the intervention for the investments. And the plan is that those interventions, um, which are, will, there will be an integrated investment program in each neighborhood. So as you can see here in Cali, it's not just a single thing. We'll do some sidewalks. We may have a new transit station. And the hope is that the private real estate uh, sector will then begin to build more housing and commercial around this transit station to create a TOD neighborhood. So how do we how do we try to do that? The, the theory is that these neighborhoods will serve as a catalyst and a demonstration so that then it will be replicated throughout the city. So there it's being replicated <laughs> across the city in other neighborhoods. So what we're trying to do is monitor the effectiveness of the intervention at the first neighborhood level and then extrapolate that onto the other neighborhoods. Another slide, please. So we expect to see a reduction in the motorized trips per person after these interventions. We expect to see the trip length reduced, the average trip length. We, we would expect to see change in the mode share with more uh, transit and perhaps non-motorized. And we would expect to see improved occupancy of the transit vehicles. So, so this, the, what we chose to do is, is 
the trip-based approach rather than trying to look at the total VKT in a neighborhood, which is difficult, we started at the next, at the earlier level of the variable. And we're trying to see how the actual trip travel activity at the individual basis changes in these neighborhoods. And then we'll be able to multiply that through to the rest of the city. So what we've done is we selected control neighborhoods, and those are the little green circles, which are similar in demographic and economic characteristics, as well as transit accessibility to the intervention neighborhoods. So the control neighborhood is as similar as possible to the intervention neighborhood, except that there has been no investment through the NAMA in those neighborhoods. And the first thing we're doing is collecting baseline data in both neighborhoods control and intervention in all three of our pilot cities. So then after the intervention has proceeded and the investments have been made in those cities, we'll collect that data again in the two neighborhoods control and intervention and the control neighborhood will then serve as the baseline and the intervention neighborhood will serve as the project neighborhood and we'll be able to see if those variables change and how much they change how much has the mode share shifted toward transit how much has the average trip distance changed because of the interventions and the investments that were made so this sort of explains why this will help us, that as we prepared the proposal initially for this NAMA and tried to estimate the effect, what we did is looked at existing data, so the trip length, the mode share, and so on, in at the city level. And then we assumed that the effects that we see in other cities in the world when they do transit-oriented development work would be replicated in Colombia. So we use this international data to do our ex-ante projection and try to estimate what kind of effect this NAMA would have. Now that we're actually implementing, we're going to see were we correct in our assumption. And so what we're doing is, we, as I explained, we'll take the baseline neighborhoods and the control, uh, the control and the pilot neighborhoods and, and gather baseline data. And then after the initial phase of intervention, we'll measure this again and use that control neighborhood as the baseline and the pilot neighborhoods. And we can see the actual effect that we got. And we can then if the projects are replicated in other neighborhoods, if the catalytic effect of these neighborhoods uh, mobilizes more TOD development in other parts of the same city, we will assume that the same effect happens in these other neighborhoods and we can then multiply this and build up and see what kind of emissions reductions we can expect in the future. Um, so what we're looking at, and Arno can explain a little bit more how we're gathering this, but we're going to look at, we explained the, the trip generation for each mode and the average trip length. And then just as in an inventory approach, we multiply this times the emissions of each mode. And we can calculate the greenhouse gas <clears throat> and we compare the control group to the intervention neighborhood. And once the intervention is replicated, we use that same, the same parameters for the rest of the neighborhoods. So we can estimate the direct effect of this, of this within the neighborhood and the direct effect in the, in the rest of the city. So these are some of the, of the variables that we're going to be collecting. 
And as you can see, we also look at some of these other indicators, land use indicators, investment indicators, just to make sure that something actually happened that we can then try to attribute the change in VKT or trip length to these specific interventions. So that's sort of a general outline of how this control group methodology is going to be applied in Colombia. And I'll hand it over to Arno to go into some of the details of how he's working with the different cities and setting up this MRV program for the next several years as this NAMA is implemented. Okay, um, thank you, Chuck, and uh, thank you, Erda, for inviting me to participate to this uh, webinar. And um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I work, um, like Erda said earlier, for uh, Ciudad. So um, Ciudad stands for the Center for Urban Interventions of uh, Advanced Development to Transportation. Um, and well, it is a program that is uh, hosted in Finditer in the uh, Colombian Development Bank. And uh, with Ciudad, uh, what we want to, to do is to boost the implementation of urban development and, and sustainable mobility projects here in Colombia. And we want to do that through the generation of public policy recommendations to national government. And one way to do that is uh, through NAMA program. So uh, basically, Ciudad uh, as a structure was uh, officially born in, in, in 2015 when uh, four of the Colombian government ministries together with Finditer and with the help of CICAP, uh, they decided to collaborate on the proposal for the Colombia TOD NAMA. Uh, this proposal uh, was uh, selected by the NAMA facility to be financed and uh, um, and started we started with the implementation this year. Well, as a reminder, I mean, Chuck already talked a bit about the TOD, but as a reminder, uh, TOD stands for Transit Oriented Development, and it is basically developing transit district or neighborhoods uh, where we want to promote the mixed use of uh, residential and commercial areas, um, where we want to develop high quality public spaces, and we want to maxi maximize the access to public transit stations so that uh, the people can uh, easily use public transport and uh, also connect that with infrastructure to promote uh, walking and cycling. So it is based uh, on eight concepts that are uh, well recognized in international literatures that are compact, mix, transit, uh, change, walk, pedal, densify, and connect. And by applying each one of these measures, uh, what we get is uh, reductions in, in, in distances traveled, uh, reduction in number of trips. Uh, we uh, can also have uh, uh, shift in, in mode shares um, from private vehicles to public transport or active transport and eventually uh, better efficiency in public transport and all of that translates at the end in reductions of emissions but also in other uh, uh, benefits or co-benefits that uh, we can see here like quality of life uh, improvement, better air quality, etc. Here in Colombia, with the TOD NAMA, we are working both on, on, on generating policies uh, that will allow transforming uh, uh, this urban development in the cities of the country, but also um, we are working on the pilot projects that are Cali, uh, Manizales, and Pasto at the moment. Uh, we are looking at maybe including a fourth pilot project, and as you can see on the slide, we already have a list of other cities uh, that uh, could be interested with a potential uh, TOD project, so we hope that over time we will uh, manage to replicate this TOD. And uh, this is the, the timeline of implementation of the NAMA, where um, uh, we started in, in, in the implementation in 2017, so we got uh, the, the pilot project definition in August this year, and uh, once we got this, uh, we managed to sign some specific agreement with each one of the cities, which is quite important. We'll see that at the end uh, to get uh, the commitment from the cities to uh, work through the, all the MRV process and the implementation, of course. Uh, we are about to hire the 
pre-feasibility studies of those pilot projects and we hope to get the results by mid-2018 uh, and then uh, we, we expect to feasibility study and the detailed design down by 2019 so we should start the construction of the interventions of each pilot uh, neighborhood uh, by the end of 2019. Meanwhile, we're also working on the MRV, so we already have the, the general MRV framework for the complete NAMA, uh, and now we are uh, working on drafting the MRV plans for each of the cities, so the idea is to have a specific MRV plan for each pilot city, um, and to do that we will also use inputs from the pre-feasibility and the feasibility studies so we can get the final plans uh, by 2019 and start uh, also get the baseline of those projects and start then monitoring um, the, 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 the implementation um, until 2030. Here are the key variables that uh, we plan to monitor. Um, so from the actions, the eight principles of the TOD, we have the effects that we have already, over, we have already talked about. And um, we are going to monitor different kinds of, of of indicators, but uh, we've already talked about the transport indicators. Um, the transport indicators um, that uh, Chuck's presented that are the average trip length, the mode shares, the number of trips per person, and the vehicle occupancy. So those are the ones that will help uh, at the end calculating the GSG emissions. Uh, but also it's very important for us to monitor other indicators related to land use, to demographics, to economics, uh, and those are the ones that will uh, help us to show the, the co-benefits uh, of the, the, the NAMA, like the number of beneficiaries, um, how the, um, the, the land prices evolve, or so the retail sales, or so the tax revenue are generated within the TOD project, etc. Once we get the variables uh, identified, uh, we also look at the boundary. Um, and of course, uh, well, we have to look and monitor the, those indicators first at uh, the TOD and the control neighborhoods. And those are the ones that we consider are going to be the direct effect of the implementation of the NAMA. But then we also need to monitor that uh, at the, or scale that up at the city level and at the national level, and those are the ones that we consider the indirect effects. The other side, we also have to think about uh, the organization and the boundaries here because we have a lot of stakeholders involved in, those, in this NAMA. Uh, at least we have the, 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 the pilot cities, we have the consultants, uh, we have CIRCAP, SUDAT, and the national government, and each one of them is looking at the different levels. So we have to clearly define those levels and the level of involvement of, of, of uh, each one of the, of the actors. And this has to be uh, clearly stated within the DMRV plan. So this slide is to show um, how we are approaching uh, each one of the variables and the way we want to monitor it. Um, so the idea be behind this table is uh, to have in, in a short way, concise way, uh, to be able to, to ask the good questions and that will help us getting to the methodology we want to apply. So first we start with the definition of the, the indicator. This one is an example for the average trip length, but and then we have one, uh, one sheet like this for each one of the variables that we want to measure according to the, 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 the previous slides that I showed you. Um, so we have the definition and the objective of each one of the variables, and then we look at the methodology to uh, generate the data uh, or, or to monitor this indicator at both the city level and the neighborhood level. So in this case, for instance, for average trip lengths, we're going to uh, monitor that by doing destination survey combined with, with modeling, or we can also think about mobility applications, and it applies the same way at the city and the neighborhood level. But for some of the indicators, we have to apply different methodologies. Um, then we also need to define the frequency of, 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 of monitoring. 
uh, and um, uh, then we define the necessary information to get to uh, this indicator. So in this case, we need to the origin, the destination, and the routes. And and depending on the use uh, that we are going to do, we can find or define different sources. For so, for instance, in this specific case uh, for the average trip lengths, uh, when we look at the baseline, we we most probably use already existing. Uh, information from the city mobility master plan because we know that they are quite uh, new and updated and available but then when it comes to the ex post evaluation when we are going to need to generate new information um, and based on the, the, the methodology that I mentioned earlier and then we also need to think about what are the resources available and we need to make that clear to uh, the city and also we have a space uh, um, or let's say um, a box for uh, comments and this is more to relate um, like external uh, factors that can help uh, to get this indicator for instance um, so again we do that we do that sheet for each one of the of the variables and then we with that uh, we can get to the list of methodologies we want to apply um, and this is basically where we are so far in the process of, of the plan but we already have some um, some let's say considerations for both the baseline and the ex post evaluation so we know that for instance for the baseline we are working we're going to work uh, with a first um, set of, of data that are going to be generated by the the, cons the, the consultants that we will hire for pre-feasibility and feasibility study but we also know that there is already existing information at the city level, secondary information, and this one will be used for the baseline. Um, and uh, this baseline, uh, we are thinking about considering years, uh, both years uh, 2018 and 2019. And when it, when it comes to the ex post evaluation, well, this one is going to be based on information that the cities are going to be uh, uh, measuring and, and, and generating. Um, this this uh, this um, this is information that they will have to monitor from 2020 to 2030 at least, and it's going to be uh, the ex post evaluation is going to be a shared responsibility between Ciudad and City, and we have to define clearly what is the role of each one in each one of the steps for each indicator, um, and eventually, so with this we'll get the direct results of our TOD uh, neighborhood and the control neighborhood, and we can. Uh, project that to get the indirect effect by using those uh, results and somehow multiply, multiplying it by the number of uh, replicated TOD neighborhood at the city level and then at the national level. Um, and well, finally, as let's say as a conclusion, uh, these are the, the challenges and the key factors that we have identified so far in the process there is still a lot uh, to go like I showed you in the in the timeline but uh, we already know that those are um, key factors to make the process successful so the, at, at the city level for the pilot city MRV plan uh, we need a strong commitment from the city and again uh, this has to be done through uh, by uh, an official document like an agreement or memorandum of understanding. Um, the plan that we are going to elaborate and share with the city, they have to be clear and concise. They cannot be too technical, they cannot be too long, otherwise uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to work. Uh, uh, and also we have to keep in mind that it, this is an evolutive exercise. Uh, it's not, uh, it's something that can change over the time as long as we are uh, implementing the MRV, we can, we have to be able to adjust the plan uh, depending upon necessities. Uh, obviously, we will have to make strong and continuous capacity building from Ciudad to uh, the city. Um, the methodologies that we will recommend to implement within this plan, they must be effective, they, they must provide uh, good data and accurate data, but that they should also be affordable. And we have to find a, the right balance here because if it's too expensive, the city are never going to be able to implement it. Um, we have to consider the articulation with other studies that are currently ongoing or studies that we know that at the city level they are going to uh, hire or they are going to make, for instance, 
if we take uh, the mobility master plan of the, of the city, we know that they have to renew it each certain period of time. So we have to take this into account because it, it provides information um, at a lower cost for us and for the cities. Uh, we will have to generate some reporting templates and tools to facilitate the, 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 the reporting of the data at the, for the cities. Uh, and we are also planning to make some yearly evaluation mission from you that so we can uh, make feedback that will uh, help us uh, adjusting the MRV plan. And also we have to take into consideration new technologies like applications, mobile phones, applications like Mobilizer, Vico that is quite used here in Colombia or Google Maps and those are uh, uh, ways of generating information that might be cheaper and uh, might generate uh, more accurate information. So this is about uh, uh, challenges and key factors at city level and at the, the, the global NAMA MRV plan, well, we need to have a clear definitions of roles of all the stakeholders and we need to have a constant articulation with all the stakeholders, especially, especially the national government. And actually, Ciudad, uh, it was built so to help uh, getting this articulation uh, by having the ministries directly involved at the technical board in, in Ciudad. Um, and we need to make sure that the methodologies that we would implement at the city level, they are homologated, they are in line with the methodologies that are implemented by the national government for the NDC um, implementation. Uh, and also we need to make sure that uh, we avoid double accounting, specifically because we know there are there, is, there are other NAMAs ongoing in Colombia about transport. and. Uh, and over the time, we, we need to uh, articulate very well with other entities to make sure that we won't uh, uh, account for the same effects of uh, both NAMAs. Um, so with this, I uh, hand my presentation. Uh, I thank you for your participation, and I hand over to uh, Urda, I guess, for the question sessions. OK, thank you very much, Arnaud. Also, thank you, Chuck, um, for your presentations. We have already received uh, a couple of questions. Here's one question to you, Arno. It says, regarding Ciudad Colombia neighborhood MRV system, the list of data did not list vehicle fuel type, fuel efficiency, or to you and Chuck, actually. So again, the list of data did not list vehicle fuel type, fuel efficiency, and occupancy rates, if I got it right. How are then PKM-based emission rates arrived at? And I will copy this also into the chat function so that everybody can read uh, what it is that we're talking about. So I don't know, maybe Chuck, you want to uh, respond to that? Uh, this, the question is of the data that was listed. Well, at this point, at this point, we're using default values for the country of Colombia. There have been some studies done, um, but these these national these uh, master mobility plan studies also have looked at the fleet composition I, and so we may be able to update using that at the level of the city if they have some more specific information but we're not going to gather um, that type of information separately we're going to use secondary sources for that um, does that is that your plan, Arno? Uh, that's that's right. That's correct. That's the plan. Um, and also, uh, so to complement, uh, saying that we are still in the process of uh, identifying what's inf what information is available at uh, the city uh, level in the city that we are going to where we are going to implement those projects. So this is part of the information that the pre-feasibility study is going to give us, uh, and. Um, and we can adjust depending upon the results of this pre-feasibility study if we uh, see that there is uh, information uh, uh, available regarding those variables that you mentioned. Well, the, the, the plan is to apply that and use that in the, in the calculations as well. Okay, thank you very much. There's one another question that is actually on the temp models that were shown in uh, in the presentation that I showed, uh, which are um, Excel-based spreadsheet models 
that were actually developed for uh, Jeff project implementation. And the question reads that in the volume, in a transport volume, the temp models are classified under ex ante category. What are the particular limitations for using temp models, e.g. for bike lanes, for an ex post estimates? The model does provide all the relevant inputs for assessment of mode shift from motorized transport to NMT. So this is the second question. Um, well, the answer is that the team was specifically designed actually originally for ex ante evaluation for JAP uh, projects to get a rough assessment. However, of course, it's correct that in uh, in principle, they can also be used for ex post evaluation uh, if all the necessary data is collected. Uh, the advantage of TIMP as it uh, comes basically is that it includes default values uh, for the measures that are to be taken and therefore it also uh, makes it relatively easy uh, to do an ex ante estimation with limited amount of data to be collected. However, it's correct that, and it's also written in the vo volume, not shown in that particular graph, but written in the volume that in theory the team can also be used for ex post if, uh, all, if the, all the data is collected. So since it's a spreadsheet model, basically uh, you can also insert your own data, it's open to that but it comes with a set of default values. Now, if you replace all of these with uh, detailed uh, city-specific data, uh, it's right that uh, TIM can also be used for exposed. And then there's a question um, regarding uh, exposed. Um, is the result from exposed able to directly deduct from the national inventory? So, um, so the question I think is, is it possible to actually uh, understand the ex post effects of uh, the interventions also by looking into the national inventory only. So since here it doesn't say which uh, methodology this refers to, but in overall um, it'll be, uh, let's say, it'll be difficult. So if I look at an urban uh, transport intervention, of course I do an inventory, but at the city level, so I look at all uh, the travels that occur at the city level, um, but in the national inventory, although I collect the same sort of data, I also collect the data on the vehicle types and kilometers travel and so on and so forth, but um, it will not be possible to actually, by just looking at the nationally aggregated data, the effects of one particular city. Uh, so for that, uh, it'll uh, you will even if you see a change in the total vehicle kilometers traveled by cars, for instance, it is not possible to relate that back to one particular city. Now, of course, if you do have a national program and you implement it in all the cities, you might want to say, I can sh clearly see that even at the national level there is a difference that I can make out, but it, it'll be uh, it's not possible to directly relate back to one particular city. Uh, scale intervention. And uh, I might want to add that per, you have your country, your national communication or however you are reporting your national level emissions, that's going to be agreed on and you don't want to double count and so if you do an analysis of your NAMA and try to subtract it from an inventory that you've done, that would be double counting. If you're trying to predict what you're going to do, you might want to, might be able to take the result of a NAMA and say that this is what we expect from this NAMA, this is what we expect from another NAMA, and, and subtract those from what has been happening from a baseline. But you don't want to double count and subtract an ex post analysis of a NAMA from another, uh, from a national inventory that you're using to report your overall national progress. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chuck, for this additional comment. There's another question to the TOD NAMA. 
and it says, is there any interaction or overlap of the impacts from the TUD measures and how do we avoid double counting from the different policies in the same area? Well, this is sort of the same same question that and that's why we're doing this as a control group method. We want to see the actual change in each neighborhood compared to a control neighborhood which doesn't which didn't get the intervention. And so this in this way we're hoping that we have an objective way to measure this to measure the effect of all of the policies that are happening in that neighborhood. So yes, if there's been a um, also a bicycle NAMA, right, the, the tandem NAMA in Colombia is is promoting bicycle uh, lanes in, in some of the same neighborhoods perhaps, then it would be difficult to separate out the effects of those two NAMAs. And you like, like I was saying before, you can't just add them together, right? You can't use a team model for a bicycle lane and then add that to the effect of the TOD NAMA. But what we're trying to do here is is measure the effect within the neighborhood of all of the interventions that have occurred in that neighborhood. Yes, and, and Chuck, I, and, and for the, the person who asked the question as well, I might add that uh, here in Colombia, like like I was saying in my presentation, it is very important to be articulated with the other entities at national level and other entities implementing NAMAS as well. And specifically, in order to avoid double counting uh, from the different policies uh, in transport, dealing with transport, what uh, we plan to do is um, to work uh, through a series of workshops that will be organized at the national uh, level by uh, uh, the, the, the National uh, Ministry of Environment. Um, work uh, through those workshops, work on the, the elaboration of the, each specific NAMA uh, MRV plan. And by doing this, we will make sure that first we align uh, uh, we align our methodologies and uh, we want to prevent specifically this uh, double accounting. But this is a quite complex problem and, uh, and we are still uh, figuring out how uh, we are going to avoid, for instance, double accounting between the NAMA TOD and this other NAMA uh, tandem that is called, it's, it's this NAMA of, uh, uh, of uh, bicycles. Okay, thank you. There's actually another question to the TOD and it says how do we compare the control area to the implementation area? So um, maybe you can just highlight that again and why do we have before and after implementation for the same uh, two? So maybe you can just explain again. Chuck, you want to say something? Okay. Yeah. So, Go ahead. in order to to measure the reduction that you have gotten from from a NAMA, you need to compare that to the business as usual um, effect. So you're comparing what would would have happened if there was no intervention, right? So if you have you have to have a, a hypothetical business as usual emission level and then you have to have the actual emission level that you measure after you've done your NAMA. So because these are only at the level of a neighborhood, it's difficult to say what would the neighborhood have looked like, what would it look like if there was no NAMA because you already did the NAMA in this neighborhood. So rather than use a projection, maybe a model or, or some sort of economic projection and to say, this is what we think the future would look like if there was no NAMA, what we do instead is we look at a different neighborhood where there was no NAMA. So this is another 
way to approach the problem of comparing the, the business as usual um, hypothetical um, emissions with the actual emissions and then subtracting them. Right? So this is this is just a different method of trying to see the effect of your NAMA compared to if you had no NAMA. Okay. I hope it's become clear now. <laughs> it's, this, it's a very different approach to what is, um, I guess, more commonly done uh, in other approaches. So, so therefore, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, of course, uh, maybe you need to get yourself into it first uh, to, to, to understand that we are looking actually at two different, uh, two very different uh, general approaches to, to the mission uh, accounting here. Okay, so um, there's also another question regarding uncertainty analysis, whether there's uncertainty analysis applied for the ex post monitoring system. And I guess this refers to any of the, of the methodologies. So maybe you want to start yeah. for the TOD? Yeah, I can start for the TOD. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, again something uh, we, we, uh, we haven't really uh, went through this uh, uh, topic of the uncertainty for now. Uh, uh, so, uh, well, this is something we have in mind, but we, we, we haven't uh, we haven't planned to include it so far in the in the monitoring uh, at the city level because again we need to make things as simple as they can be at least at the beginning because uh, if we make it too complex uh, uh, we are afraid that uh, at the city level with the help of the city we are not going to it's going to be difficult the implementation is going to be difficult so so for now we we, we, we haven't uh, tackled this issue of the, uncert the uncertainty this is something we have in mind but uh, we haven't tackled it in the plan okay, and in, in the yeah. surveys or in the sampling of course you know, we want to make sure that that we have a statistically valid sample yeah. But beyond that, I don't think we're we're looking too closely at the uncertainty. Okay, and then for the uh, for MYC, I must say that M Mobilize Your City is just starting implementation. So uh, actually, it's just that the first cities are starting with the data collection. So so far, it's there's no ex post <laughs> assessment as yet. Uh, it has been done. Um, so um, it's an issue to be taken up. Of course, it's always um, it's, it's the best practice to do it. Um, and what definitely should be done is to verify the data um, as much as possible that is being collected. But there's, uh, yeah, there, I guess there's no pre described. Uh, uh, assessment of the uncertainty that is currently uh, being uh, done or examples for it because the work is just beginning. Then we have another question to Colombia and it says what kind of emission factors is the Col Colombian NAMA going to use? Is it well to wheel or tank to wheel and why? Uh, and if it's well to wheel, what sorts of information uh, do you use for upstream emissions? I, I assume this is tank to wheel at this point. These are the numbers that we've been using. If the Department of Environment wants to change that to look at the upstream emissions of uh, of the fossil fuels, then we would be able to incorporate that, I'm sure. But at this point, the numbers that we're using are, are coming. I guess they're coming from Ambiente, right, Arno? Yeah, I was about to say um, we we will use the factors that uh, were defined at the national level. So by the, it's actually uh, the Ministry of uh, Mining and Energy. Uh, so they they define 
factors for a specific type of fuels for the Colombian context and the idea and those are the factors that were used uh, uh, to make the national uh, greenhouse gases inventory so uh, and also used for the NDC so uh, at some point we have to uh, use those factors uh, for the ex post uh, in order to make sure that the results that we are going to get uh, can be homologated with the methodology uh, that was used at the national level. So we are going to use those factors, it's called FECOC, uh, the factors for the Colombian fuels. Okay, thank you very much. So the TOD NAMA is in great demand in terms of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is good. Yeah, it's good. And uh, the question is, uh, back to the control uh, group, is uh, how do you select the control neighborhood? What are the cr key critical uh, criteria uh, that, so that it is as comparable as possible? Okay. Um, well, this is, this is a tough question too. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because we haven't solved it yet, uh, let's say, uh, as a whole, but uh, Chuck already gave some, some, some hints on this, but uh, the, the control group, the control neighborhood has to be somehow similar to the TOD uh, neighborhood, so that means in terms of size. Uh, when we talk about TOD neighborhood, we talk about uh, a neighborhood that is uh, with a diameter, let's say, of uh, 500 meters around uh, the main transport station, a public uh, transport station, let's say, that, that is average. So basically the, the control group should be the same size, more or less, and should present more or less the same characteristics. And, uh, and hopefully it has to be a neighborhood where at this point, at least, we know that there is no intervention plans by the city, um, which doesn't mean that over time there won't be interventions. But uh, um, uh, I think this, this are, this, those are, let's say, um, a criteria for the definition of those control uh, neighborhoods. And um, but this is something that still has to be uh, defined for each specific city. And the plan here is. Um, since we uh, uh, we start the pre-feasibility study study next month, so part of the responsibility of the consultant that we will hire is to identify two or three potential control neighborhoods, and uh, together with the consultant and Ciudad and CICAP and uh, the municipality, uh, we will define which one is the uh, the, the most suited to be uh, the control group, the control neighborhood. Sorry. Thank you very much, Arno. I think this question really come, is at the heart of this uh, MRV approach, is to find a good control uh, neighborhood in order to, yeah. to minimize the uncertainties. Maybe, maybe to summarize the answer, there is no uh, specific rule for that. Uh, we are going to uh, define it depending on each case. We have some minimum criteria, but then we have to look at each case separately. And the next question is more on the, on the data availability, and it reads, in cities with truly limited resources who cannot fund a TRIP or OD survey, and the only available data are vehicle registrations and total fuel consumption, uh, is, it really, is there value in doing a crude greenhouse gas estimate? So this is, of course, a very... Uh, a very important question and so thank you for it and I think it's a it's a problem that we are often confronted with uh, working at different uh, with cities that are different uh, levels of development also different levels of data availability so um, what I I think there's two <laughs> two answers to this uh, question and first of course that you always need some local data so uh, without any local data, because here it says also like rough national data split proportionately between the cities, if you only have also registration data at the national level, then it'll, um, it'll be difficult uh, to do so. What is important is that um, you actually have, uh, 
have some city-specific data if you want to calculate the city-specific emissions. What is also done in a, in a different approach, not a territorial approach, what is sometimes done is what we call inhabitants approach, where you really just look at the emissions of, uh, of the inhabitants of your city based on the number of people who live in a particular city and then just multiply this with average uh, vehicle kilometers traveled uh, and average uh, emission factors as well. So then you really just get a very, very rough idea that you can maybe use for like ex ante rough estimations to, to, to get an order of magnitude uh, answer on uh, the emissions of a particular city. However, if you really want to look into the emissions of the city and also how they develop and, and look at impacts of different interventions, there's no way around of collecting some local data. And if you have, however, re vehicle registration data that is city specific, then of course you can already, uh, you already have a much better basis to, to use that and then uh, look at, um, at average VKT values based on this particular vehicle fleet then calculate uh, your local emissions. What we've also done um, is uh, to work with traffic counts and this was done, for instance, uh, in the example I quickly showed from China that um, really looked at the, at the, at, at the city le uh, territory level, but used traffic counts on different street types for, and different counting points to actually calculate uh, uh, the volumes of vehicles on the streets and then multiply that uh, by the street network length. Uh, generate the VKT data. And this is a relatively comparatively cheap uh, approach. Of course, it's not uh, as detailed information as with a, an OD matrix, but uh, it generates uh, your local VKT data at, at relatively uh, small cost. So this can also be done. So I hope that this uh, uh, answers your question, but if you go city level, you need to collect some local data. So of course, everybody would be happy to be, <laughs> if it was possible to just use uh, average data, but of course, uh, there's no way around of collecting also local data. And there may be ways to use the more um, you know, cell phone based approaches. If, yeah, right. if you live in a country where there's a good percentage of, of uh, mobile phone users. So then there's a, a slightly different question, uh, which refers to what was mentioned before uh, regarding the implementation progress. So the question is uh, that we mentioned that implementation progress is also being uh, monitored. And if you could say more about it, uh, Chuck, maybe you want to start. Well, we developed this three-tier method of monitoring so that when you first begin, you're not going, especially with a TOD NAMA, you're not going to see a change, very likely to see a change in trip length, for example, if the first intervention is to construct some new sidewalks or perhaps some new apartment buildings or mixed use is going in. So you're, before you're able to see changes in the travel activity, you want to make sure that implementation is happening so that you can correlate or you know, can try to correlate that. So what we're doing is looking at the different changes in the land use. We're also monitoring the changes in, in policy. So if a city changes the zoning controls in a TOD area, we count that as of progress on implementation. So all of these things are the very first level of monitoring just to make sure that the actions are happening or to, to note what actions have, have occurred. Second tier is to start to look at changes in the travel activity and then the third tier is to actually calculate the greenhouse gas emissions reductions that have, have happened. And that's all talked about in the current
compendium as well. Okay, thank you, Chuck. I can just add a little bit to that. Uh, and um, it's just as you mentioned, also for MYC, um, of course, the idea is to, because we, especially in this inventory approach, we calculate emissions at the city level. So, of course, it's also important to us to understand uh, at least indirectly what sort of uh, impact can each uh, individual uh, measure have or is it at least is the measure on track so we can assume that if let's take a bike lane a bike bike line is being built and we then uh, we know that the uh, x kilometers of bike line have been built and we also know uh, by uh, actually monitoring the bike lane that people use it then we can say okay we don't calculate exactly the effect of the bike lane because it will be almost impossible to actually um, to isolate the effect of that particular bike lane uh, if a bus lane is also built at the same time and maybe has good bike parking spots and so on. But uh, it, at least it shows us that you know we are the bike lane is being implemented and people accept it and they use it. So what we said uh, and we also include information on that in the MYC methodology that I showed in the beginning um, and which was also put in the handout uh, in, in the annex to that. Uh, we also have uh, an overview of implementation indicators uh, and we basically say we can distinguish between two types so you can have the just really the progress related so X kilometers of bike lanes have been built and then the quality related uh, indicators where you actually look at how many people actually use the bike lane because what good does it do if the bike lane was built but nobody uses it. So you actually get these two different levels also for implementation indicators in terms of actual progress itself and then also the quality of implementation and there are a few examples uh, in there for that but of course it will always depend on your particular policy package uh, and the particular measures that you are implementing what will be the most suitable indicators to monitor mm, and of course they must also find a compromise between what is also feasible in terms of the resources that you need to monitor those but of course uh, much of it is also just by the project implementation of course you you have to take stock of these things and many of these will already be covered by that and then maybe some additional surveys may be necessary to to actually have an even better reporting on it so i think that's uh for the implementation indicators also from my side uh i think there was one last question just need to find and uh, this says the TOD NAMA is also developing national replication policies to increase uh, TOD penetration and what is the approach for monitoring those uh, national and local replication policies? Well first we're going to look at that at the implementation level so that we'll make sure that you know, a policy is actually in place. So, you know, that would be the first level. And then we'll try to see if TOD neighborhoods are being replicated in other areas. So the, the, the implementation, I mean, the implementation of a policy is, is difficult to know. And we, in our framework, that we developed, we have several different benchmarks to show, you know, if a policy has been passed, been approved, if there's been some evidence that it's changed the behavior of either the local government or the national government, or if it's changing the market conditions. So, you know, those policy replication uh, measurement is, is mainly at the implementation level. And then as we look at the number of neighbor, TOD neighborhoods that are replicated, we can try to attribute that to the policy. But you know, actually measuring the greenhouse gas effects of a policy is, is rather difficult, except at the very, very large level. Yes, and uh, 
I might add that uh, at the planning level, let's say, we uh, from Ciudad, we are also working directly with the, the ministries and the local governments to uh, assess them and formulate recommendations that they can uh, uh, include into uh, their local and national policies uh, recommendations uh, on TOD. So uh, we also uh, uh, try to keep track of this and uh, so to get uh, an idea of uh, how many policy documents include uh, recommendations on TOD concepts. So this is this is the first the first like the first step, and then and then for the implementation. Well, uh, I fully agree with uh, what Chuck just uh, mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've actually covered all of the questions. So now it's just for me to say thank you again uh, to everybody for to the presenters, also to all participants for taking part and also for asking the questions. It's always very helpful for us uh, also to, to understand what are the concerns uh, of, of other participants and questions. And um, I would like to announce that we'll have the next episode of the, uh, this webinar series on fuel pricing policies on the 22nd of February next year. And presentations will be uh, given by Jörg Füßler from Infras who, uh, and another colleague from Infras, Felix Weber, who actually uh, developed the fuel pricing policy uh, together with uh, the, the technical expert group that was set up by uh, the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, who actually came forth with this uh, MRV methodology. So, Jerry Seeger from the uh, VCS, who is uh, representing the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, will also be present. So if you're interested in fuel pricing policies, please also join us again for the next episode and we'll send around the announcements uh, in early next year. So thanks again, everybody. Um, it was a pleasure uh, to give this webinar and I'm looking forward to see you online again next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.